now to introduce Pam Katz. Pam is a frequent collaborator with Margareta von Trotta, the great German director. Uh, Pam wrote, co-wrote Rosenstrasse, I don't speak German so I probably didn't pronounce that right, The Other Woman, and uh, the recently completed Hannah Arendt starring Barbara Sukova. She's currently writing a book about the um, partnership between Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill, and she also wrote a novel about La Delenia. Um, Pam and I teach together in the um, MFA program at Tisch, uh, the, at the film school at NYU. And I also yeah. love Nora Ephron. D despite the subject matter that I work on, I aspire to be as funny and she's wonderful really funny. as she was. Believe it or not, <laughs> she's very funny. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to ask a couple of questions and then open it up to you all for questions. And what I want you to talk about first is um, what was the genesis of this film? How did this come about? Come about? Okay. Um, can you hear me if I speak? I think it's okay. Um, okay. I received an email from a producer I'd never met, a German producer, and he told me that he'd heard about this incredible story about a couple. There was a documentary about it and a very brief journalistic book, and there was a couple who had escaped from Auschwitz, and they had lost each other for 30 years and found each other again. The, the email was about five lines long, and I thought, the first thing I thought was somebody wants to make a film about Auschwitz, I'm not sure I can do that. But then I got drawn into this love story which sounded almost preposterous to me. But he sent me a DVD of the documentary and I saw the, the real couple. And um, what I was saying to Susanna earlier is that it was, it was not a very good documentary. It was very clumsy. There was a lot of bad music. Um, they staged the scene where they met each other again. You could tell that it wasn't the first time. But it was so moving, even in that form. And the story grabbed me completely. And I thought the first thing that really caught my attention was that I was identifying with this reunion of this couple in a way regardless of the circumstances. And, and it's very rare that you can find a story about two survivors of Auschwitz um, where you relate to them directly as people, where they're having emotions that you can recognize. So I found that a very fascinating point of departure and decided to, to go ahead and do it. Originally, they came to me and said it was going to be um, a format that's quite common in Germany. It was to be two times 90 minutes. And they wanted to have the first half be the past and the second half be um, the future, or in that case, well, the 70s, as I said it. Um, and th they knew a lot about the past. We knew about the escape. We knew what you saw here, to a certain extent, is true. And we'll get into what's true and, and what was made up later. Um, but they. We really don't know what happened to the couple when they met again, except that they saw each other 13 times. She visited him in Poland uh, 13 times until she suffered a stroke in the year 2000. Um, and then he wrote her every day for two years. Um, so they had a very powerful relationship, but nobody seems to know what actually went on. So I wrote the two parts. and it, was sent to the television station and they sent it back and they said, well, this is great, we want to do it as a cinema film, um, but we want mostly the past. Could you just do the past story and then have them meet at the end for 10 minutes? And I said, no, I can't, I can't do that because I think that, that, that what's really interesting about their story would, would be lost. So I came rather slowly to this construction where I decided that it should be told in an interwoven way. And I think critical to that was I wanted to see this particular story through the memory um, of one character. And it became important to me that we recognize at a certain point that she's telling us this story. Um, and, and that was how I decided what the overall structure would be. But backing up, um, there was a few things that I that really surprised me about the story on a factual basis. And the first one was, if there are people here who are knowledgeable, you'll know this already, but I didn't know that anybody escaped from Auschwitz. So the f one of the things I wanted to find out was how unusual was this story. And I, and I did some research, and one of the numbers that, that floats around the most often is there was actually 600 attempted escapes from Auschwitz, um, about a third of which were actually successful. 
And that shocked me. And what shocked me even more than that is that there were four attempts in which the man stole the uniform of an SS officer and, it, and attempted to escort their girlfriend out of the camp under a variety of guises. Two weeks before the couple whose story jump-started this film, somebody tried the very same thing and got caught and were brought back. Um, so that was all kind of, on the one hand, you show this film as this most alarming event that you've ever seen in your life, but as you research it, you realize it's still alarming, but it isn't singular. And I found that actually encouraging to me because it wasn't, sometimes when you, when you write about this awful time in history, you don't want to pick out the one story where everything seemed to go relatively okay in that they did escape. And it was somehow interesting to me that it wasn't typical, but it was possible. Um, and the second thing that I found interesting, and we were speaking about this as well, is that I didn't realize there were really true love stories in Auschwitz. I know there's a lot of sex. I know there must have been a lot of temporary um, moments of bonding, but men and women couldn't speak to each other. Um, that was punishable also by all kinds of horrible things, if not death. And I didn't think you could really form a true relationship that was that deep, that would in fact last for many decades. And I found that very moving as well. And, and these two points for me were how I began to write the story of the fictional version of these two people that you see here, that there was, it was possible to fall in love in the worst possible circumstances, and it was possible to escape. Um, the only thing I would add to that before I throw it open is um, it was difficult to write a story of true love amidst this the most barbarous time in the history of the world. It, as important as it is, I thought it was kind of trivializing. And when people escaped the camps, as many of you here probably know, um, there was horrible punishment for those left behind, and there was horrible punishment if you were caught and brought back, and there was horrible punishment for anybody that they thought might have been connected with that escape. And therefore, although the the real life character and many of the characters who attempted escape were often connected to the resistance, as was the man that this character is based on. The story of stealing the photograph is a true story. Somebody did take photographs and smuggle them out and bring them to the independent Polish government in London, and that was how um, several people were convicted based on these photographs, and that was how we actually knew what was going on in the camps far earlier than I think I realized growing up. Uh, there was pictures of it. But this particular character didn't steal a photograph. And for me, it was very important that he not just, just be escaping to save the life of the woman he loved under these circumstances. I wanted to give him another vital reason. I wanted him to be more idealistic. I wanted it to be worth risking what the consequences of those escapes would be, and that was very important to me as well. So it, that was one of the cases of a true story that was grafted onto another one. I'm just going to ask you about one more thing that I, I know about, and then we'll, we'll let you all ask questions, which is um, this aspect of writing fiction from truth. There are many things that are really interesting about it, and choices you have to make, and decisions you have to make, but there's one thing that really happened that you didn't put in because nobody would have believed it. And I just want you to talk about that, okay. the release papers. Okay. Um, in actuality, when he stole, this particular fellow stole the SS officer's jacket in real life, there were escape papers in the pocket, quite by coincidence, for, two pr for one prisoner. And that was the way he was able to get past the guards. And I thought, and they were color coded, so it also made the escape very urgent. There were certain colors of, this, of these papers that were distributed and they kept changing them for the very purpose of stopping people from forging them or using them in the wrong way. And I just thought I couldn't, it just can't be that he steals a jacket and the papers are in the pocket. I didn't think anybody would in fact believe it. I think all throughout this, this wild and bizarre story that happened on a number of occasions where you had to kind of figure out what would be believable on an emotional level as well. Um, the character of the mother, for example, um, she, 
She's, by the way, very hateful and my favorite character in the film because I felt that as a mother myself, I really understood her fear and I understood a lot of the things she did at the same time as I despised them. Um, it is true in this case that they escaped and it took them 10 days to walk home through Poland, which is a very difficult place to walk through in that time because almost every individual in Poland was practically on a different side. I mean, there was independent Polish loyalty, there was Russian loyalty, there was loyalty to the Germans for selfish purposes, there were also many Germans. Um, so it was quite a tough 10 day walk and in fact when he did arrive at his family home, his mother, who was Catholic, did say, not welcome home after four years in Auschwitz, but your girlfriend is Jewish, get her out of here. I won't hide her. And it's disgusting, but it's also, at that time, if you were hiding a Jew, you would die, and your son, who you hadn't seen in four years, would die, and your other son, who is in the resistance, would probably be hunted down and, and killed. So while it's not, I like to think I wouldn't have done it, I understood her as a character. Um, in fact, when she tells her son that his girlfriend is dead later in the film, I made that up because I believed that she would do it. She had lost everything that she had and everyone she knew and she didn't want her son to leave her. The real way in which that particular couple separated was very murky and unclear. She was staying on a farm but not with family and he went back into the resistance as soon as he got home and I didn't understand why he would leave her and none of it made any emotional sense to me. So that was another case in which not the coincidence of papers, but the emotions didn't make sense to me. Um, although, he was very idealistic and he wanted to help end the war. And people who joined the Polish resistance, they really wanted to help end the war more than anything else. And that was one of the reasons I also told myself, it's okay to let him steal the photograph because he clearly was a, had a very heroic character in, in many ways. Um, so I, it was not the right facts, but I thought it was true to his character. Time ago, I believe that one of his daughters actually lives in the States, but we hadn't tracked her down. I, on that note, they really were the departure point. It is a unique story even if four other people did it, but it was extremely important when you write a film like this that it's not a, a docudrama. I just, that's partly why I'm letting you know how we, I grafted different sets of facts and fiction together because it's a very different thing when you read a book about two people, like the film I just did about Hannah Arendt, for example, you, you don't, um, it's still not a docudrama, there's still fictional elements, but you're sticking to the life and experiences of one person. And that's not the case with this film, although this couple was undeniably at the center of it. When she passes out and he takes her to his mother, that was a miscarriage. In fact, by the time they met again, her husband was dead. I brought him back to life. That's what we get to do as screenwriters. <laughs> um, Why did you do that? What did, how did that serve the story? Um, the reason that we did that was because, again, one part, when you're making a film where two people are prisoners of Auschwitz and escaping, um, whatever you do in their life afterwards, it can kind of pale compared to that. And if one wanted to take what was truly universal about this story, which is what is it like when you meet somebody who's the love of your life, add to that that he saves your life under the most horrific circumstances, and then you lose each other, and for 30 years, you live with somebody else who you also love. And it brings up a question that can apply to many people in many situations. Did I was that, did I live the life I was meant to live? And in order to bring that home, what was going on in the present day had to have the importance and urgency and vitality. There had to be, in a way, a decision for her to make. And when she finds out that he's still alive and she's married to somebody who she loves very much, that's part of what makes you crazy because you can't go back, you don't even want to go back, but you can't help going back. So bringing him back to life gave us a couple of opportunities and one of them was that I felt she wouldn't tell him right away because she didn't know what on earth she was gonna tell him. Um, she can tell him he's alive, but okay, then what? And it also, in her case, it spirals her back to the way she was when she first escaped. And, and it was a, it was something from which he'd healed. And when she goes back, he recognizes it. And he's seen her like this before and he wants to go with her. He's been with her all this time and, and he can't. So we brought him back to life to uh, make that 
overwhelming feeling and then decision for her more dramatic. And one other aspect of the story that I found very fascinating was researching what actually went, happened in Poland. And at least as far as I was concerned, there was so much that I didn't know. There were many Polish people who were uh, loyal to communist Russia. That's true. The home army was in favor, which was a very specifically different army than the Polish um, resistors who supported the communists. They were the army Krakowa, they were the home army. They were the ones, when, when you hear about the brave Polish soldiers in the forest, you know, fighting with sticks and stones, that was them. They set up an independent government in London when the Germans invaded Poland. And they were in favor of an independent Poland. They were not in favor. They were, in fact, specifically fighting against um, the idea of being taken over by Russia. And they, in fact, the Russians, after the war, there were many people in the home army that valiantly fought the Nazis. There's a famous, um, the most famous battle is the Warsaw Rising, which is not the uprising at the Warsaw Ghetto, but the Warsaw Rising. And that is, in fact, it's not 100% spelled out in the film, but the idea was that that's where he goes to deliver the film in Warsaw. He gets caught up in the Warsaw Rising, where tens of thousands of Polish people died trying to fight the Germans off. There's some controversy about this, but as I read about it, the Russians were on the other side of the river and thought, let the home army take down the Germans as much as they can while we stand by and wait. After the war ended and the Germans lost, the Russians came in and they rounded up anybody from the home army that they could find and sent them off. And either they were either killed or in prison camps for a very long time. It's extremely complicated, each separate situation of how that happened. But the scene that you see there was actually quite typical. The moment you tore the, you know, the swastika off your door where the Germans had commandeered your home, the Russians drove up and took it over again. Again, I don't, you know, I don't like to talk in terms of, you know, the horrible Russians, the horrible Nazis. I don't ever want to make that equation, but in the case of Poland, there was a lot of really terrible stories, but that's why. You were asking about how the ambulance drove up and saved her. That, that was actually, there were these ambulances called the, um, the uh, from Bernadotte, they were from Sweden, and they actually drove around the countryside of Poland as these, when they, lost the war. Uh, the, this scene that you see, again, if we'd had more money, we would have had thousands of extras instead of 40. But people were roaming. People were really, really, quite literally walking home or walking to anywhere where they had a relative. And these ambulances did, in fact, drive around and pick people up. Of course, not by far everybody. But many, many ambulances drove around in just that way. I'd like to say what is true, which is that my father is a German, was a German Jewish emigre, and um, left Germany in 1936 with his um, with his entire family. Fortunately, um, certainly that is the real reason. Although the fact is, I rather avoided this subject for a very long time, until um, Margareta von Trotter called me up and said that she had been trying to make Rosenstrasse for the longest time, and they had told her that she had to have a modern day element in it, and she wanted it to be from the point of view of a Jewish New Yorker. Um, and we had friends and colleagues in common, and she thought maybe I'd be interested. I was a huge fan, still am, but at that time, I, Margarita was one of my heroes. I actually thought it was a friend playing a joke on me <laughs> when I got this, hello, this is Margarita Fontrada. <laughs> um, so we met, and she said oh, that she wanted the main character to be a, um, a very orthodox Jew. And I thought, oh, well, my father was orthodox, although we weren't raised orthodox, and my mother as well. And I thought, oh, my, I don't know anything about this. I, I said, I think it would be much better if they would be secular Jews, because we would be giving a better parallel to what was going on in Berlin at the time in the 20s. And so she said, try it, and I did. And slowly, as we worked together on the film, it was actually Margareta who realized that I had really not embraced my past. I loved working with Arne Rosenstrasse and I loved the, everything about the film and that was also an, an amazing, yet another unbelievable true story. But it was there that I began to realize that I had to kind of take a look at this aspect of my background and then I married a German <laughs> and I lived in Berlin for several years and I fell very much in love with the stories surrounding Kurt Weill and Bertolt Brecht and the Three Penny Opera, and I was just kind of in. 
However, when, as I said at the beginning, when I received this email and they said, part of the story takes place in Auschwitz, I was extremely uncertain. And if it hadn't been for the power of the individual story, I, I don't think I could have done it. Because I did do a lot of research about the way the camp is structured, how the, you know, the Polish, the political prisoners were, had a higher place in the hierarchy than the Jews, and then there were the criminals and the whores, and they had these jobs, and they had this kind of mobility, and you really had to understand how the camp was structured in order to understand how he could even steal that uniform, or speak to her, or find a room where they could have sex. All these things didn't make any sense to me until I began to understand how all of that worked. And that was one of the most difficult um, that's one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life because I read a lot about Auschwitz. I went to visit for the first time and that was haunting. And I wasn't actually sure at a certain point that I was going to be able to come to the end of it because it, you just can't. When he says he's taking her to the Puff Commando, it is true that the brothel was off the camp proper and that was a way to get her out. I mean, that was another thing. There's an incredible geography to, What's really incredible is when you start looking into it, it starts to become a real place as opposed to just a nightmare. And that's very difficult, but you had to get inside it to write about it. Whatever ends up being in the film is one thing, but when you write scenes and people move from their bunk, what can you call it, you know, to a meal place, when they steal something, you have to know how they're walking, how they could walk. I, I was amazed to find out that they landscaped it. There were landscaping commandos. They were planting flowers. All these things I found very haunting and very difficult. So um, it's a lot more fun to be writing about the Three Penny Opera right now, um, even though they too had to leave. Uh, in my version, what happens is that that officer is coming and he wants his horse and he's looking for the groom and he knocks on the door where um, the mother lives and where she's hiding a Jew uh, for which she could be instantly killed, and he asks to have a cup of coffee. And so she's trapped, and she has to give him a cup of coffee, and she has to hope that he won't discover that she's hiding a Jew. Um, the director, I think, chose to change that for a variety of reasons. I think that there was a case where after he leaves and she's not caught, the mother is once again so terrified. And all she really wants at this point, all she has the hope of, at this point is that her sons will survive and she'll have some semblance of her family. She's not going to risk dying or have her son risk dying for this young woman. So she's so furious that she throws her out. Um, a lot of times when you actually film a scene and you have an actress and they feel that they've been passive too long and it was a problem with the character of Hannah, the young Hannah, is that she is quite in many ways passive. And this was a chance for her to actually take the initiative to realize that the mother tried to betray her and be the one to walk out instead of being thrown out. Um, I think the director felt along with the actress that she would do something that crazy before realizing that she was endangering herself. I don't quite agree, but I think that that was the psychological motivation. She's so anxious to get this woman out of her life that she actually risks her own life to do so. Every, something always changes. I mean, as a screenwriter, what you are used to is a screenplay is one thing and a movie is another. And what it takes to bring your ideas to life uh, isn't always your precise dialogue or your conception of the blocking of a scene. Um, often, many, many things can change, but your original intentions are sound. So I would say it bothers me when I feel like uh, my original conception of the piece um, is, is no longer visible. It bothers me when I work very hard to make things plausible and something is then implausible. But I don't object to changes from the page to film because really it is another step in the life of a movie. It has to come to life on the screen, in pictures. Um, it has to work for an actress. I mean, a lot of times you go, you'll go through tremendous changes uh, just talking to an actress who doesn't want to say it the way you want them to say it and you have to figure it out. So there's so many steps between you sitting alone in your room and seeing it before your eyes and, and getting it up on the screen. And 
that's not even talking about practical considerations. Um, this film was shot, I think they had 30 days, and which is relatively short, very, very little money, and lots of things that were meant to be in eight scenes or in one room, so, you know, you do the best you can. In real life, I believe he was divorced, um, and her husband was dead, so, yes. It would have, they were older too. They actually remet in the 80s. I pushed it to the 70s so they could be a little younger. And I also thought it was an interesting time in Poland in the mid 70s for them to reconnect. There is a world in which she would find out he's alive. She'd go running to her husband. You know, he's alive, the man who saved my life. You know, she's told him all about him, and they would be inviting him over and, and you know, and, and celebrating. But it's too overwhelming for her. So he does feel shut out, I think, as a husband, but he also sees her going back. And he's just, again, he's amazed to see that door shut, that he pried open, you know, and in a way he saved her life too. Uh, let's see, well, there was the first round was, um, well, usually, you know, when I get a story like that, where I get a paragraph and then I get a half hour documentary, there's any number of months where you just research or that's what I do anyway, because I can't possibly, even if they told me they wanted to make these exact people's life story, I would still have to research. So like I say, so I know what it, what was going on in a camp, what was going on in Poland, what, you know, what, are the, what is the psychological condition of a survivor? All of these things take a lot of research. So that's for me the first step of several months. And from that I would generate this treatment that they then came back and said, okay, you know, forget all the second part, start again. Um, and then you do, after that it's hard to say, because it's not just when am I done, it's then you do a first draft, then you get it, then you take it around to directors, and then you get a director, and they come in and speak, and then the director and we decided we'll bring the husband back to life. Okay, that's draft two, but is it? It's really another draft one, because it's all different. And from there, uh, you just do successive drafts until it's done. I first got this email in the summer of 2006, and the film first began being filmed in the fall of 2011. Long time. That, five years is actually, I would say, about average, okay. wouldn't you? Average. Or yeah. Maybe it, not in your Honestly, it felt quick. <laughs> five years is not, unfortunately, is not a terribly long time for that gestation. I, I mean, in Germany, too, where you, when you fund movies, the funding, you know, they're funded region by region, and I, actually it goes along, they used to fund the royal art, was funded by the different dukedoms, and the lines are actually still in all the exact same places, so you get money from North Rhine-Westphalia, you get money from Berlin Brandenburg, and you know, like okay, and in one region they're rich with coal, and in another one they have this. So you wait, and they all have different deadlines and cycles, and you need eight of them to even get going. So it can, you know, you can be happy if it doesn't take a decade. Huh. First of all, getting to the writing stage. Don't forget that's a different stage. Usually, I read and read and read and read until I, my eyes are burning. Months. Um, once I start writing, I write. I hate it when people say they write eight hours a day. I do, but you're not sitting there writing eight hours the whole time because, first of all, writing is rewriting. So you write and then you read it the next day and you throw it all out and revise it and then you write to come to an end and you continually revise. So the moments of pure imagination, that's not eight hours a day, but the actual sitting there and going through all the steps, I think it is, when I'm not teaching. Well. That's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you.